Hello, and thank you very much for coming to this webinar talking about taking the next step after graduation. My name is Dr. Brandy Wiegers. I have my PhD in applied mathematics, and um, I work at Central Washington University. That said, I believe a lot of what we're going to talk about today would be valid for, for most undergraduates who are trying to take and take that next step especially as they're thinking about if they want to take and go to graduate school or not go to graduate school, just trying to take and decide that question for themselves. So we need to take and start off with just asking, making sure that we all have the same shared understanding about um, some of the next steps that are possible as you leave undergraduate, your undergraduate institution. Um, if we are going to clump things into broad categories, I would say we have three key categories that we often take and talk about as the next pathway or the next step for students as they graduate. Um, the first being graduate school, the second being industry, and the third being teaching. Um, those are not presented in no particular order. Um, Graduate school is going to be something that I explain a little bit more in depth later on in this presentation so that you have a better understanding of what that potential um, pathway would look like. Industry, what I'm talking about there is um, the possibility of going and working for a company like Microsoft or Google or even local companies um, where you're taking and using your major um, to take and, and better go move forward a goal that that company has. And teaching is an option where you're, um, we're here we're talking about being a K-12 teacher and um, teaching your particular topic. Um, most likely, if teaching is gonna be the pathway that you are interested in, you should currently be getting a, a degree in teaching. And um, I would say that the best resource in regards to furthering and understanding that pathway after graduation is talking to the faculty members that you work with, um, because that's going to be a process um, that's going to be slightly different than what we're going to talk about today. So I encourage you to, to reach out to them. Um, what we're going to focus on today is the possibility of, of going into industry or graduate school. Um, and with the note that if you do go into graduate school, it is always possible to then go to industry, or it's possible that you would go into academia. In other words, you would become the professor that is teaching the undergraduates, and we would have a complete loop. For most of us as faculty, um, most of us went to undergrad and then graduate school and then academia, so that's the pathway that they were most comfortable talking about because it's the pathway we walked. Um, but we have friends and colleagues that have taken in um, gone through any of these other pathways and we would be happy to take a talk with you about their experience or put you into contact with them so that you would have mentors to take and discuss those possibilities. So knowing these options, um, the things that I'm going to take and focus on today is the process of taking and preparing to apply to either graduate school or industry post-graduation. So how do we actually do this? How do we apply for your next opportunity? Looking at those two possibilities, graduate school and industry, and I would almost say in a lot of ways teaching as well, there's going to be very similar things that you're going to need to prepare. The first is going to be a resume or CV. Um, in the slides that are attached to this presentation, you can click through on the link that will take you over to career services for our particular university. There's going to have a lot of resources to take and walk you through that process. Here I distinguish um, most often between a resume and CV based on length, um, resume should be one, um, two pages, CVs can be, or curriculum vitae's can be much longer um, as you've had more experiences. Resumes are gonna focus on projects, professional skills, um, employment opportunities that you've participated in. CVs are gonna take a talk about an additionally academic activities, course history, and other aspects of your, your previous experience. So you'll want to take and look at your career services pages to get um, ideas on how to craft those. In addition, for both graduate school and industry, both of them are gonna want some form of personal statement, a statement of purpose in a lot of times. This is gonna be sometimes a one to two, even all the way up to five page statement, um, or focused cover letter that talks about your interest in the position, it's going to take and have personal stories that demonstrate your ability, your skills, other experiences that you could bring to a position. This is going to be something that you craft either towards going to graduate school or going into your industry position. Either way, it's really focused and talking about your personal story. That's why it's called a personal statement. 
In addition, both of these positions, both of these pathways are going to require some form of recommendation, some a form of other reference of some, uh, oftentimes a faculty member that can take and support you and talk about your personal successes in either their class or a program that you worked on together. Some ways that they can take and reinforce um, that those stories that you've shared in your personal statement are stories that are that are true and, and can they can continue to take and demonstrate for their abilities and skills that you have. There will also be some of some form of application for both of these processes at the individual site. Um, I'm not going to talk about that in detail because oftentimes it just involves finding one of these three things and copying and pasting different parts into an online form. One thing that you should note for graduate school is you're probably also going to need transcripts, something called the GRE exam, as well as an application fee. Um, this is not going to be the case in regards to industry. So again, that's why towards the end of this presentation, I'm going to switch over and only talk about the graduate school process, and we'll have more details about those things then. So as we're talking about these aspects that you need to take and pull together to take and apply for your next position, your next opportunity, what you'll know is that you are putting a lot of yourself into those, those um, descriptions. So it's important that as you are preparing for graduation, you're making sure you're participating in experiences that will set you apart. Um, a lot of ways that people have done this is through work experience. For example, on my university, you can take and work at the tutoring center. Um, and um, in mathematics, if you have a B plus average, um, B plus in all of the math courses, and 90 credits at least, um, so um, that you're at least a sophomore level standing. Um, you could also look at internships or research experiences. These are things that professors or career services can help you take and find. Um, it's going to be important that once you've done some of these experiences, that you write about them, that you talk about them. This is going to be good practice as well as um, a, an experience that you can take and add to those statements, to those CVs, that reinforce that you have these abilities before you go out and try to use them. You could also look at volunteering or teaching, and we have an, an after-school program called Mass Circle here on our campus. That's a great way to take in and gain more skills. Um, any way that you can do some sort of extracurricular leadership, ways that you can take and make your stand, stand out as, as demonstrating that you have both academic and leadership skills are things that are going to help you in making your statements, making your CV stand out. Because what we're looking for in a well-rounded application that we're sending either to graduate school or into industry is going to be personal experiences, strong coursework and strong recommendation. Something that's gonna have a gold star in it, something that's really gonna make you stand out is gonna have leadership, lots of communication opportunities for you to do projects where you've written about mathematics or written about your personal topic, written about and presented about it to a group of people. Um, and coursework, what, what people are looking for is not only good grades, but also coursework that is relevant and challenging. So if all of you, you have straight A's, but they're all freshman level courses, that's not going to take and look as well to these, the people that are reviewing this application as taking and challenging yourself and doing a lot of courses towards whatever career you're hoping to go towards. So part of what I'm hoping to, to do today and what we're going to focus on is not how to find these experiences, but how to take these experiences and really take in and pull them together in an application because you're gonna to have to do some form of application statement. If you're, in, if you're going to graduate school or if you're going into industry, you're gonna to need to take and write to people that are gonna be your bosses, your mentors, your colleagues, and you need to tell them, you need to communicate to them that you are going to be a part of the system and that you're gonna be an enjoyable part to be around. You wanna tell an interesting story. You wanna talk about particular instances where something exciting happens using very specific examples. So again, in mathematics, instead of saying, I've always loved calculus and linear algebra, all of mathematics is great. Instead, I'm gonna talk about the fact that this one time in linear algebra, I had the opportunity to take and visualize in three dimensions using balloons. I'm gonna add pictures to that example, and I'm gonna take and really take and, and give examples for a very specific instance. The goal for that is you're looking for people to take and relate to you. You want to talk about things that you have in common with these people that you're hiring. You don't want to take 
um, you want to share the thing that they share, which right now is the topic that you're graduating with. If you're getting a math degree and you're getting hired to do math, you want to talk about the math that you're doing. If you're getting a history degree and you want to get hired to do history, you want to talk about that. Because that's the thing that is they're excited about. That's the thing that they want to hire you for. You want to make sure that you talk about it with details. You want to talk about that in a way that's going to take and avoid creating bias. So an example that I use in mathematics is that when you start your essay with, I always hated math until, automatically you've already given the reader a negative experience. We climb onto airplanes and the person next to us says, Ugh, I could never do math. I always hated it. And that's a reinforced negative experience that we've had. So you want to make sure instead of reinforcing that negative experience, you're starting off with something positive that we could look forward to talking to you about over coffee in the lunchroom. Um, some other things that you're going to want to take in and be able to do is watch qualifiers. So an example that I have here that I've seen in a lot of essays is the difference between a student that writes, a professor helped guide me through doing this project, or I did this project under so-and-so's guidance. Well, the first statement gives all the, the ownership of that activity to the professor, and the second statement takes ownership of your particular work. And doing these things, I'm, I've given you a list of all of these things that you're going to want to do in the statement, and doing these things well really requires you to take and do the statement ahead of time. This is not something that you throw out to take and summarize your life's passions one night before the application is due. And this is the reason that I've spent so much time on the slide. You're like, this is stuff I don't need to know for six months from now. I'm not even going to apply. This is a list. I'm pointing out this list. I'm giving you this list to reinforce for you that writing an essay that does all of these things takes time. So um, that is what we're going to talk about today is how do you take and find the time to put together an application that does all of those things, that shares the gold star person that you are with these places that you are applying to. And the thing that I'm going to tell you is that it takes time. If you are interested in the graduate school pathway, I would suggest that you spend the summer and fall before you apply. Those applications are going to be due in November or January. You're going to need to be making decisions by April. So that whole entire process is going to be done before spring quarter. Um, that means that if you are most likely you're taking S, um, you're going to be taking your final exams while you also are trying to take and finish these application essays. And what I'm trying to really encourage you, I'm trying to show you, if you want to be able to incorporate all of these things into your application essay, then it's going to be really important that you start earlier than during your 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 winter um, your fall finals. You run into the sort of similar things for those of you that are looking for industry jobs. I would again encourage you to start that over the summer and fall. My experience has been you start looking for places to apply um, around November all the way through March. You start submitting applications in spring. Um, and even in doing that process and being really proactive, for those students that have waited, especially until, until June after they've finalized graduation and they've moved back home, I'm seeing those students take six to nine months before they're getting a position. By taking and starting the process over the fall, you can start submitting applications in March, which is much earlier than June, and you're going to get that position that much earlier. So it's that much less time that you have to spend staying on somebody's couch or, or paying rent when you're still looking for a job. This is, um, it's just going to really help you be more on top of the process. In addition, it's going to give you the opportunity to take and meet and visit and have much more productive conversations with things like the career fairs that your campus may be, may be hosting. So these are things that can be helpful as you're, as you're looking for taking your next step, is really trying to start early. Because there's a lot of stuff to put together. And so um, with that, I want to take a moment for those of you that are going into industry and, and that's all done, then let me, let me just assure you that um, if you do want to take and start the summer before, um, I do have a whole entire process where we meet throughout the summer and um, I'm very happy to take and support you in taking and, and getting ready for some of those things that you're gonna need to do for an application packet. For those of you that are going to graduate school, I wanna take a moment um, 
to take and explain to you what graduate school is all about. For those of you that are just curious about it, give you a little bit more detail. And for those of you that know you're going to go into industry, um, I'm going to have you go ahead. You can stop the webinar now, and I will see you at the boot camp um, and wish you luck on your, on your job search. So with that, what is grad school like? Graduate school, um, when I tried to make a map of it, ends up looking a little bit like this. So it's a lot of stuff all shoved on one page. What you can see if we start up on the left is that graduate school starts off sort of very similar to what you have here as an undergrad. It's going to start off with coursework and exams. Um, oftentimes when you go to graduate school in a specific field, you need to take more coursework focused on that field. Whereas a, being an undergrad, we really want you to be a well-rounded individual. We want you to take mathematics and history and English and physical education. When you get to graduate school, we want you to take and find your favorite topic and just stick with it. Don't do anything else. And so you're going to have coursework that focuses on that. Um, you might have um, written exams. At my particular um, graduate school experience, we had two written exams. Um, my degree is in applied mathematics, so I had to do a written exam that lasted um, three hours in um, analysis and a written exam in differential equations. Um, for those people that were doing pure mathematics, they had to do a written exam in um, algebra and a written exam in analysis. Um, and similarly for other programs across campus, um, there was um, some form of written exam where you say you know enough about this topic to be able to take and move forward and try to take and design a research project because you understand the fundamentals to mathematics or you understand the fundamentals to your topic. Once I passed those exams, um, I, I then began starting to work on research. And I worked on that research and I found a question that I was really excited about and then I had to take another exam. This is called a qualifying oral exam or other places call it a dissertation proposal. This was an oral exam where I presented, um, I had to write up a proposal, it was about 15 pages, and I gave that to a committee of faculty members. And the faculty members then came to a presentation about that topic um, that I put together and then asked me for about half an hour's worth of oral questions about that topic at the end. Um, the whole process, amusingly, was actually on my birthday and it took about an hour and a half. And so that was how I passed my, my dissertation proposal, my, my qualifying oral exams. And when I finished with that, they said, you know enough mathematics to be able to do this research problem. We, we wish you well, and they sent me on my way. I then spent three years working and continuing to look at that research. I then started to write up a report called a dissertation. It took me, that was around 250 pages long, and it was all about my particular topic. So what I hope you're hearing is that we keep on doing coursework, we keep on doing work, but it's getting more and more narrow. It's getting more and more focused. By the time I wrote my dissertation, I defended my dissertation, I was one of 10 experts about my particular topic in the whole entire world. I, I really knew what was going on and I could, I could really tell you the whole entire system. And once I got done with that, I was able to take and graduate. I got my Hogwarts robes, as you can see over here on the right, and, and it was a great day. So that's about the process. For me, that took six years. Um, and that was for a full PhD. Um, six years, um, it just sort of depends. You'll see um, if we go more towards the right of page and we're looking at this image, we have two degrees listed here. Graduate school both encompasses master's programs and PhD programs. Master's programs are shorter. Oftentimes they're going to be one to three years um, and they're going to take, and sometimes they just involve exams and sometimes they just involve coursework and sometimes they involve um, writing a small thesis. PhD programs um, are, are longer. Sometimes you get a master's and then a PhD. Um, PhD programs um, are, are sort of, you start with sort of the same basic work, but then you're gonna do a more in-depth research project, more, more focus on trying to take and answer a, a question, and you're gonna spend longer on that question than you would for a master's program. 
Now, describing all this process, I'm, I'm talking a lot about academics, and that's the joy of graduate school. Graduate school is your opportunity to take and do your particular topic full time with very minimal uh, outside obligations and just an opportunity to, to just fully immerse in studying this particular topic. But at the same time, you might be doing other things. You might be teaching. This is one of the ways um, that oftentimes graduate students are able to afford to go to graduate school is they teach classes for undergrads. You might be going to conferences. You might be doing professional development around teaching or about your particular topic. You might just be getting, getting um, better acquainted with it around the world sometimes. And you might be doing um, fun social events. So I, I participated a lot in the graduate students math club. Um, you could also be doing volunteer work. You could be participating in your church. You, the, the key that I'm trying to show here over in the yellow column is that even though you're doing a lot of research and you're doing a lot of really beautiful academics, it's also going to be important through this process that, um, that you're staying true to who you are. So you're still taking care of you. If you're a runner, you're going to do that. If, you're, if you love um, Ultimate Frisbee, you're going to join the local club. But, but you aren't giving up everything to go to graduate school. It's still going to be just an extension of your experience that you had here as an undergraduate. And it's so much fun. Um, one of the things I want to point out why I share this is these are all of the red dots on this particular map were places that um, in going to graduate school, someone else paid for me to go. They paid, they paid for my plane ticket, they paid for my hotel, they paid for my meals. And it was amazing. I got to learn so many things from so many different people, literally from around the world. And that is fun. It was fun to get to talk about mathematics with world experts. Somebody that you had read their book for a whole entire year, and then you actually got to meet them and talk to them and learn so much more about them. That was amazing. It was also really, really hard. Um, going to graduate school was, was harder than going to undergrad. You had everyone there was really focused, and they were um, really excited about doing their topics as well. And so that kept them really, um, it meant that you were constantly tracking and working hard and um, really being challenged. And that, that can also be fun. I add here a note that realistically, I also just need to add the disclaimer that graduate school can be, um, according to research, um, one of the most challenging um, experiences after undergraduate. It can be very isolating and it can be, um, there's high rates of depression amongst some graduate students. And I say that because I think it's important to be blunt about mental health and really reach out and find resources um, and making sure that um, you are in the right place to be able to be successful in graduate school at that moment. Um, my next note is that it should be free. This is true for people that are in STEM fields, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It may mean that you need to teach a class. I'm not saying that you're going to be living a high life. This is, this is not going to put you in the 1% um, for, for income, for sure. Instead, um, it, it's going to pay, hopefully, your rent and your, and your tuition. And it's going to let you just spend the rest of the time really focused on taking and studying your particular topic. And that's, that's the joy of graduate school. Um, I write here math and only math. And, and that's going to be true. Whatever your topic is, this is your chance without any other obligations. Um, as a faculty member, I have to be in committees. I need to teach classes. I need to be applying for grants. I love doing these things. It just means I don't get to do math all day long. And so um, going to go graduate school is really your opportunity to really fully immerse yourself in just one topic. Now, when... Other graduates, undergraduates have heard this presentation. I usually end up with two questions, and I want to address, address the var variations of those two questions before we end this webinar. The first is, what are the differences between undergraduate and graduate school experiences? Um, oftentimes, students are actually asking, there's a, there's a huge difference in the course workload between undergrad and grad school. And um, I think that's just really up to you personally. Um, for me, I had a double major as an undergrad before I went to graduate school. And so going to graduate school was the first time I had done my particular topic for every single class. And that was a really big change. 
um, before I'd been doing um, science courses and math courses. And this was the first time it was just only math courses. And I, I, had, I didn't have the study skills right away to be able to take and balance doing both of those things successfully. But once I found that, um, I was really able to, I really enjoyed graduate school. Um, so there can be a huge difference. Um, other undergrads I know um, where they were only a single major and they'd already been taking and, um, and doing, for example, mathematics full time as an undergrad, um, the, the transition to doing different topic, um, wasn't, it wasn't really a transition in regards to topics, but there was just a lot more expected of you. There was a lot more people that also were really invested in the classes and that pushed them to do even more for the graduate level classes. That said, when they got to undergraduate school, it's not that they enjoyed every single class. Just because you enjoy mathematics or just because you enjoy history doesn't mean that you're gonna enjoy every single variation of it. But it does give you an opportunity to, to focus in on the classes that you really do enjoy. And so um, there's gonna be a balance there. Um, the other thing that might be different in regards to going to grad school and undergrad is the type of grades. Um, oftentimes, at least in my program, the expectation was that you were getting A's, A minuses, maybe B pluses, but anything below that was really um, cause to be concerned. And so it's important that you talk to the graduate school in regards to what their expectations are. You should really be, be looking at getting really strong grades for the graduate school in order to take and be successful. The next question that I often get is, how do I know if I'm a good fit for graduate school? Like there's a lot of times there's, there's two variations of this. First, someone is just asking like, am I, am I smart enough to, to finish a PhD or master's program? And I'm gonna say, yes, I, I haven't even met you. We're doing this on YouTube, but, um, but everyone I think has the ability, if you find a topic that you really enjoy to fully immerse yourself and move forward on taking and doing graduate school. The question is, um, are you gonna be able to take and find the time to be able to do that successfully? Being able to fully immerse yourself for some people takes a different amount of time. The people that I found that were the most successful at doing this were parents, um, because parents really know the value of their time and would really much, very much structure their time from that nine to five when they were at graduate school to be focused on taking and doing their academic work. And then once they, they left, they very much focused on raising and raising their, their children. And um, so they compartmentalized and that helps them really push forward in doing their master's or PhD program. So I would really say um, that, that this should not be something that you should hold you back from applying for graduate school. But oftentimes, it's, it's not just this ask about if I'm a good fit, it's also asking like, can I handle the emotional stress of graduate school? And so um, to that, I really think it's about you knowing yourself. Um, the second set of people other than parents that I knew that were really, really successful in graduate school were the ones that knew why they were there. They knew what they were hoping to get out of it. They knew what, what topic they wanted to study. They just really, we're looking forward to the dedicated time to take and study their topic. So think back about your classes. Is this something that you could do full time? Could you just study this topic? Could you just do these homework problems? Could you be challenged in thinking about this so many more hours a day? Also talk to faculty. They're gonna have a really good um, idea of what their particular experience is and they're gonna be able to share that with you. It's important to talk to different faculty and get different perspectives. And finally, I'm gonna encourage you to take in contact past students who are in graduate school now. You can either look through the club Facebook groups or maybe find through your department's LinkedIn page, but there's ways to get a hold of people that recently left your particular undergraduate institution and are now at graduate school and to hear from them about what their experience is like. Do your research, and I think you're really gonna have a good idea about if this is a good next step for you. And the advantage is you can take and apply for graduate school, and then if, if it, it isn't a good fit, if you don't finish out, if you don't find a good school, you still have time to take and apply for industry jobs. And all of that work that you put into applying for graduate school is really gonna prepare you for those industry jobs. There's gonna be a lot of overlap, right? Because that resume, the personal statement, the letters of recommendation, all of those are really gonna overlap and prepare you for industry. 
Now the things that aren't are these are these things towards the bottom. So let's let's talk about these application requirements. Really, I'm encouraging you to the summer before, you know, I'm gonna say this over and over again, just start early, start early, start early. You want a statement of purpose, you want a CV or resume, letters of recommendation, all of those are gonna help you towards graduate school. Maybe even think about applying for fellowships, which are like a graduate school version of scholarships because that's gonna help you make sure your application materials are ready for graduate school. The thing that is slightly different is also this GRE. This is the one thing that is different from, from um, applying for industry. So let's talk for a minute about what those are. In addition, let me tell you that if you are around at my particular university, at least, I, I try to take and work this out, I schedule it, and we, and we meet regularly to take and support you in preparing these things. If you aren't at my university, I encourage you to look and find other programs on your campus. We really, as undergraduate institutions, really want to support you in taking and making this next step. So. We've already talked about what makes good application statements. Um, this is going to be something that you want to just slowly work on all summer. You know, in June, write for 10 minutes about what makes an interesting story. Come back to it in July. Is that still interesting? Write more, write more, write more. Um, ask for letters of recommendation. This is where I'm saying if you can take and do some trial runs so that you are applying for scholarships or if you're applying for foundation um, for, for fellowships, this is going to help make sure you're just your letter writers um, also are able to practice your letter over and over again. It takes about one month for letter writers to prepare an application. If if you don't have that one month, if you just found out about an opportunity, you can ask for them with ask for them with less time. But you just you're going to get your best letters if you give letter writers your professors at least a month. Um, you're then going to just want to keep reminding them. One week prior to the deadline, remind them that it's due. Two days before, remind them again. Day of the deadline, make sure you are being persistent. This is for you. It's not personal if you're reminding. Also make sure, though, to thank your letter writers. Thank the people that are re recommending you. I say this about graduate school. I'm going to remind you if you're applying for industry, you still need recommenders. I'm going to tell you to remind your recommenders that you are writing their, their, them down so that they aren't blindsided if they get a phone call. They actually pick up that phone and, and respond to the questions that the company is going to ask about them. Um, and also still make sure to send thank yous. It just helps to establish that network and helps establish that communication. And now going back to this list, I keep telling you there's this thing that's called the GRE. Let's talk about what that is. GRE stands for Graduate Record Examinations. And essentially what you can think about is that this is sort of the graduate school version of an SAT or ACT. This is gonna be a computer test that's gonna test on analytical writing, verbal reasoning, and quantitative reasoning. These are gonna be 30 minute sections, that 30 to I guess 35 minute sections, and you're gonna have five to six of them. So it's gonna be a long, long morning or long afternoon. Um, it's gonna be something that you can take almost any week throughout the year at an on-campus testing center. And for those of you that are looking at this, um, especially like for example, quantitative reasoning, or these are gonna be your math problems, you're looking at about a high school level of material. So for those of you that are getting math degrees, this is actually something that, even though you're fairly certain that you feel confident that you can do the mathematics for your senior level courses, it's still worth going back and reviewing because this material might be something that you haven't thought about since you left high school. Um, it's also something that I'm telling you about today because you might need to start budgeting for it. Um, you can take and the exam itself is going to be $205 per attempt. And um, you, in order to take and send the scores, it's going to be at $27 per school that you want to send it to. So this is not going to be something that you're going to want to just do um, to see how good you do for it on it. When you do do it, you're going to want to take and prepare for it. Um, you can do that through the testing services. Um, our campus has GRE prep courses. Kaplan also runs GRE prep courses online. There's a lot of Facebook groups or, or um, apps that you can have on your phone. Lots of ways to help you prepare. So that's the general GRE. That's going to be something that you also don't want to put off too much because if you're going to take and teach, and um, they look at the writing score, for example, 
um, to make sure that um, as an as a, um, instructor for their undergraduates that you have a high enough writing score to be um, that they feel comfortable for you to teach their, their undergraduates. And so that's something that you're going to want to practice because if your score is not high enough, they will make you take additional courses before you are allowed to take and um, teach undergraduates. So this is something that um, I, I would, I wish the system was different, but, but you need to be able to be prepared for and do well on. In addition to the GRE general, some schools, some specific subjects require you to take and do the GRE subject exam. This is covered in six different topics. You can see those listed here on the left. It is something that's done on paper and only offered three times a year, spring, September, and October. These are gonna be definitely covering college level material. Um, and in fact, um, for those people, for example, in mathematics, it may be topics that you don't even see until your senior year. Um, and so it's gonna take reviewing over the summer to like at least be introduced to those topics to make sure that you're competitive. This is something that if you decide you're going to take, I highly encourage you to take um, two to three months and study for it seriously, um, because this is again something that has um, a high cost associated with it. And um, you wanna make sure that you're prepared to take and be successful at taking the exam. This is not gonna be something that you just take because you feel like it. You're gonna make sure the schools that you are interested in taking and going to graduate school require it and that's when you would start preparing for it. I'm telling you about this now, because um, if this is something that you are interested in, for example, in mathematics, this is something that you should start researching as soon as possible and start studying for over that summer when you're doing other things to take and prepare to apply to graduate school. So, this is a brief introduction, and I'm asking you to pick the right next step for that's left for you. There's many different options, None of the answers are wrong. It's just about taking and finding the thing that's best for you. Either way, you're going to need to prepare some form of summary of the experiences that you've had up until now in regards to employment and academic activities. You're going to need to write some form of personal statement that really demonstrates your interest in taking and doing future steps. And you're going to need to have people that can recommend you for taking and doing those things. If you can find support on campus, I highly recommend participate in my programs, participate in those programs, just, just look for support. But no matter what you know, no matter what you do, just know that um, there's many different pathways to success. So with that, um, I encourage you to reach out and talk with me about this further. And I wish you all the best um, in taking and doing um, your search for your next steps after graduation. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.